Hey, how's everybody doing? Can you all hear me okay? Cool. I got a little nervous with the dinosaur illustration. I'm not that old, uh, <laughs> but uh, I do love dinosaurs, so that was pretty cool. Um, we're talking today about content choreography, and I was told that it's obligatory to include choreography from White Christmas in a talk about choreography. Uh, this is my mom's favorite Christmas music, uh, or movie, and I watched it every year growing up at least once a year. And this scene just always felt so out of place in the whole movie, and I don't know where it came from. I tried uh, looking up the history of this particular song and dance routine. Why was it there? Is there some kind of cool trivia about a particular director or producer or actor who just had like an artistic itch to scratch, and so they had to squeeze this in, even though it doesn't do much for the plot at all? And I couldn't find anything, so that's my assumption. Somebody really wanted to do something cool and artistic, uh, and in that research, I did find out that Bob Fosse was an uncredited choreographer for parts of White Christmas. But today, we're going to talk about not just wedging animation into things to scratch our creative itches, or a whole host of other not-so-great reasons, and we're going to talk about good reasons and good methods for animating parts of our interface. A couple of warnings before we get into things. Content warning, there will be animation, uh, hashtag DZY, if that makes sense. Because a number of slides will have moving parts, will have animation on them, the slide deck itself uses a, a simpler fade to hopefully reduce the overall motion. But anyone here who has a concern with a vestibular discomfort, um, be warned that there will be slides that are animated as well as a couple of GIFs along the way that move. And then I also want to give a realism warning. You're going to see exaggerated effects in these slides. So if you're like, ah, oh, yeah, I want to do that animation in this thing I'm building at work, and I'm just going to copy the code out of the slide deck, and it's cool, you can do that. It's Reveal.js, so it's the web. Uh, I'm going to do it exactly like he did. And I would say maybe ratchet things down like 20 to 70% or something. Uh, some of the effects I'm showing are exaggerated so that they work well on the screen or so that they can clearly communicate the kind of motion we're going to, but they would be a bit annoying or overdone in a user-facing app. So, all that out of the way. Oh, one other warning, like this is kind of my sleepy zone in the afternoon, so here's the deal. If I yawn, you can yawn. <laughs> and if, if I fall asleep, can you just dim the lights and we'll all get like a little nap time and we can proceed on time to the very next talk. Gain a little bit of time that day. <laughs> all right. So first question I want to ask us and answer together is why do we animate elements? And there are a lot of reasons depending on who in your organization you ask. If you ask somebody in the biz dev side of things, they're going to represent their client's interests and they're going to say, we have to animate because we want to set our client site apart because if we make their site look and feel and be better than their competitors, they're going to get more clicks and that's more dollars. And yeah. That's like as a baseline bottom like business reason, that's a good reason to consider animation. Or, and anybody here who's done time in a design role has probably heard this reason, we need to animate it because we've got to make it pop. <laughs> um, yeah, so when somebody tells you that, you can just do the community pop pop thing and see how they respond. It's probably a good way to get out of that conversation and maybe the job too, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, but that's such a vague and nebulous thing, and it's unfortunate, but that language still shows up sometimes. Another reason you might get, why should we animate this site, is to show off your developer skill, and this might be a reason you give yourself. Uh, for a long time, code that animates things on the web has been like our skill set. Designers don't have the tools to prototype that. You know, they're still doing lo-fi moving rectangles with magic move and keynote. And we're kind of finally at a place where design tools, the applications that provide prototyping animation are getting good. And in a couple of years, they'll be really robust, I would expect. Um, but we make something move. And the other day I did one, it was a dismiss the little cookies warning. And when you click the dismiss button, it just kind of zoom, slipped off the bottom of the screen. And nobody expected it to actually move. And the stakeholders were just like, whoa, why did you even do that? That was so cool. And they kind of did the mind blow. And they want to know how you do it. <laughs> And because we like our job security, when they say, how do you do that? The answer is simply magic. Uh, <laughs> not telling you anything else. Uh, that's one reason why we might animate things. Uh, but there is a better reason. And here's kind of the bottom line, the biggest reason I want to give for why you should animate a site. And that is to communicate meaning about content. Communicate meaning about the content on the page. And we need to do this because as humans, we're storytellers. And you might say, no, one time I tried doing a scary story at a campfire and nobody shivered. Or I tried reading my kids or my niece and my nephew a bedtime story and they didn't like it. They were just wild. I'm not a storyteller. No, no, we are. Here's what happens. 
When events happen in our experience, things around us, we make up narratives to explain the reasons, to connect the dots between those events. And sometimes we do a good job of that. Sometimes we do a good job we don't want to do. Maybe you've had a friend who goes through like this whole long season of years and like every four weeks it's another toxic relationship ending. And sometimes you have a hard conversation where you say, hey, there's one connecting thread through all these relationships. Uh, data helps us make better stories. Um, but sometimes we do, we do a bad job telling the stories between the events we're happening. And if you've studied logic or rhetoric or debate, you've learned a fun Latin phrase that describes when we do a bad job making up stories for the events that we've been observing. Post hoc after this thing, ergo propter hoc, therefore because of this thing. Since event A happened and then event B happened in close succession, A must have caused B. Or the mantra you might repeat to keep yourself on the, on the good path if you're doing data analytics and data visualization is correlation does not imply causation. Just because a bunch of lines and dots on a, on a chart kind of occupy the same space doesn't mean that dot pattern A caused dot pattern B or that B caused A even. I used an app for a while called um, Exist and you can plug in a whole bunch of like API things and it provides like life recommendations for you and it kept telling me things backwards. Uh, it would send me a notification that said, hey, we've, we've watched your data for the last few weeks and on days when you burn more calories, guess what else happens? You also get more steps. And I said, no, no, it's the other way around. The steps are helping with the <laughs> calorie count. Um, sometimes we make mistakes when we try to tell the story. You see this a lot in superstition or ritual. Uh, he's got to tap both his feet and then his head and then brush the bat and then step backwards and we'll uh, go to a different game and he's going to do the same thing. Step forward, tap both feet, tap the helmet, brush the bat. And this is, you know, the story is I did this once and then I had a great at bat or the rest of the game was awesome and so I'm going to keep doing my little ritual <laughs> and people uh, Bryce Harper's is a little easier. He just kind of taps across the plate like this a few times. Uh, you know, you have basketball players who have to dribble the same number of times every time they go up for a foul shot, free throw line. And when you put it all together in one little clip like this, it's, it's riotous. Um, yeah, post hoc, sorry, telling bad stories. And this happens in the digital world too, right? Whenever we do things on our desktop, we open up Windows Explorer, File Manager, Finder, whatever the name of it is in your operating system. And if you want to open a file in the right app, how many times do you click it? Two. Now, if somebody has told themselves that story, if I want something good to happen with the icon, I got to tap it twice. And they show up on your website and they bring that story with them to your shopping cart checkout form. And they double click <laughs> that final submit button. What happens? Of course, animation is not the only solution to that problem. You want to have uh, also data validation and a disabled state on the button and a, a bunch of other things. But Sometimes we do this in the digital world too, and we're, our goal here today is to learn how to help our users avoid those post hoc errors with our apps. Animation can tell the right story. If we animate an interface in a thoughtful, meaningful way, then we can give users a good story proactively. They're going to commit fewer mistakes. They're not going to have as many bad stories running through the back of their mind while they work, and they're going to be less frustrated with us, and they're going to use our app more, which is kind of the goal. So we help make sure they don't make up the wrong story. For the next set, uh, in kind of this idea of, of making the right story appear from your app, I've titled the next sections as uh, like a quotation from like a character in a story, as if your element is speaking or playing a part or role in a narrative. And maybe that's a strange metaphor, and if so, I'm sorry, throw away the metaphor, keep the information hopefully. Uh, but we're going to look at that, and this is also the section where the animated slides live, where we've got examples. So if that's a concern, uh, here's your warning, the head's down for a while. And I should offer a warning uh, for the people who are not watching right now, but who will be watching in the future. Uh, last time I did this over Zoom, Zoom didn't keep up with animation super great in the browser. So if that's the case, I do have the link here on the bottom of the slide. And if you're watching this in the weeks to come, uh, you can <laughs> click the link and just follow along in your own browser and hopefully see the animations at the right speed and with the right polish. So let's jump into it. What kind of stories can the elements on our page tell? I'm important is an easy one. As it's already been mentioned, if stuff moves, it looks important. You can use motion to show what deserves a user's attention. If you've come to Wikipedia or Stack Overflow with a hash in the URL for a particular answer or a section of the site, it loads with like an orange or a yellow background that then fades away. That color motion uh, shows that, hey, this is a section that's actually highlighted. This is the one your URL fragment really points to. 
If you have a form, as users progress through the form, you could put a focus animation on each field to gently pulse as the user focuses on it. Don't pulse in and out like this. You're going to drive people up the wall. They will not enjoy that. But a simple short pulse on focus may work well to communicate to users, hey, this is the thing you're in right now. Don't get distracted by other fields. Fill out this one. Uh, another one here is you've probably heard the phrase scrolly telling where cursor, where are you? As the user scrolls down the page, things fly in. And with four rows all doing the same thing, it gets pretty repetitive. So this is a good case study in what not to do too much of. Uh, but as users scroll down a page, you can call attention to the sections of the site they're reading by animating parts of the site in and out. A more specific kind of conversation that your app could have with a user, a story it could tell, is play with me. A little bit different from just I'm important. I'm important means look at me, read me. Play with me implies interaction. Uh, Matt just mentioned this in the Maps context. On Hover, you can change things, move things that communicate to the user. This is a thing that you should be clicking, tapping, touching, typing, etc. Uh, it's a great, kind of, uh, a great place to connect it to your Hover state if you're using CSS to control your animations, which is a good thing to do. Links, inputs, buttons, don't do this to things like paragraphs and divs that don't have any click events. Uh, if you tell a user, hey, I'm important, uh, or play with me, I'm, a, I'm interactive, and then nothing happens and they click, you've betrayed their trust, and you know, you've cried wolf, and they're not going to like you for the rest of the time in the app. Um, here's a button, for example, I like to imagine this as, uh, because it's leaning, it's already kind of conveying motion, right? It's uh, that unstable shape. So I'm imagining in my brain as I, I made the slide deck, this is a button for checking out at a, at a store that sells motorbike parts, because they want speed in their branding even. And we could, on a, on a user's hover here, we could change the background of the button, right? And that'd be simple, and everybody kind of does a transition on the background color. But to communicate that brand and that motion, what if the background color slid from the edge? And now the button's background, or the hover state, is making the same motion that the angles of the button as it leans are going, that to the, to the left forward progress idea. Um, so you can communicate this with animation. And of course, once a user does interact with something you want them to interact with, you want to give them confirmation. Give them some kind of feedback that you did the right thing. Uh, you could take a success button and gently pulse it, and then of course disable the form, let your you know, async request to submit the form run without letting them click a bunch of times. Or you could shake a button and say no. And you wouldn't want to have it on a loop like I'm doing for the sake of the slide deck. You'd do it once and then you'd scroll them up to the error and highlight that in ways that are very visible. Uh, don't just rely on a shaking button to tell people which field needs to be corrected. And on the opposite side, sometimes your app needs time. Sometimes it has to process a request that's happening off-site, and you have to wait for that, recall, or that call to resolve, and you need to tell your users to slow down. Hang on a second. Don't do things. Um, busy with an async action, form submits, or lo loading new content. If you like accessibility ideas, here's an awesome one. If you're running these animations with CSS, use the aria busy equals true attribute on the element. That tells screen readers, hey, this thing is getting fresh content. It's busy. It's, it's not really interactive at the moment. Just wait a second, and the screen reader will pick up on the removal of that attribute as well. Uh, but also use that as a CSS selector. That way your CSS visual slowdown animation state is tied in perfectly to your accessibility attribute. And here are just a few examples. You can do the spinner. Everybody likes to make a spinner. These three, by the way, are all no new DOM elements. This is just CSS you can slap onto a form. You can zing back and forth, a little blippy thing. Or the three dots, of course. You can animate those in and out as people watch. Or, you know, <laughs> if the whole app has a problem and needs them to wait, you can just throw this on top of the whole thing. Uh, remember that episode of The Office where everybody's watching the TV behind Michael and they cheer whenever it gets really close to the corner and he thinks they're actually interested? I'm not going to let this go long enough for you to do that to me. No. Oh. Okay, fine. <laughs> yeah. But another story we can tell is, is we're connected. You can communicate that elements are doing the same thing or in some way related to one another. Help a user process the information on the page that way. Motion can show relationship between elements. This is good with an off-screen nav. Have the nav animated in from the same place as the button. And also, pro tip, have the close button for that off-screen nav be in the same place as the open button. Don't make the users click here to open the menu and here to dismiss it. That's, that drives me nuts. 
Um, another way this could work out well, we're connected two sides of the same coin here. A user who wants to log in just needs their username and password, and what does this form do? It makes them give up the password before they get access to the innards of your app. Create a new account is the same thing with a brand new user, so what if you made them the same thing with a little bit of motion? And you can go in CodePen, and there's all sorts of really neat examples, far better than this one, of ways you can animate and move around parts of the sign up slash sign in, uh, two sides of that coin. A more specific version of we're connected, because we're moving in the same way, is I come from a particular place. Uh, if your data is coming out of a certain source that's visually represented on the page, when new elements showing that data come uh, onto the screen, you can animate them in from the element that represents their source. Uh, accordions and submenus, great way for this. Uh, this is really tiny, so I'm going to zoom this in a smidge. We've got a nice mobile-friendly navigation here. And as you click on a button, it shows the sub-navigation growing from its title item. That's nothing groundbreaking. You've probably seen that or maybe even implemented that already yourself. Uh, or this one, uh, we just learned about maps. Uh, this is a kind of an animation I prototyped for a, a map including app that I worked on years ago. And on Hover, you can make the uh, cool little tooltip show up. And, that one wiggles back and forth, so it's definitely sure to annoy your users after about the third interaction. <laughs> uh, which, quick sidebar, animations that get repeated a lot because of a user action that takes place over and over and over again in your app. A couple rules of thumb for that is one, avoid animation, or if you're really clever, find a way to kind of like gradually lower the animation duration after the user has done that a few times until it just doesn't happen. You don't want to be a, a pest about it. Um, and the other thing is, if the animation is going to be repeated a whole bunch of times from the very get-go before you deploy, considering reducing your duration. Make it happen faster. Don't make them wait 200 milliseconds every time they hover on a thing and get slowed down. Of course, the opposite side of I'm coming from is I'm going to. Uh, show the destination of a piece of content. You can do this with Add to Cart. You can do this with like a messaging or inbox related app. If somebody deletes or archives a, an item in an inbox, you can zoom that row across the screen into the trash icon or into the archive or into the folder they've sorted it to. Uh, this is a CodePen demo that I didn't do. Credit where it's due, it's not due me. Uh, but as you add something to the cart, it animates the product photo and drops it into the little cart zone over there on the edge. It doesn't do anything else, so sorry. You can, I really wish to change the color, but it, it doesn't. So those are six or seven different ways your animated elements can talk to users. That's not the whole list. There's probably dozens more, but for the sake of our time together today, I wanted to kind of get the, the ball rolling to provide some seeds, and for you all to take those back at starting places, so when you think about animating something, you've got a few tools in the tool belt already. You can add more as you think deeply about what you're communicating about the parts of your animated elements in your app. So why should we animate? What is animation? Uh, communicate. And then lastly, how do I animate well? What are some more pro tips for things I can do in my animation to not be annoying, to not be inaccessible, to not cause problems for users? So give it life. Um, it's okay that Privacy Badger has replaced that Vimeo button. We're not going to watch the video today. It's too long for our, our talk time. But it's a, a video, and you can, again, this is all web slides. You can watch the video on your own time. It shows some of the principles that Disney's animation team puts into their drawings. And it goes way back. It's a slightly older video, and it's really neat about the ways they use motion and exaggeration to give character and life and personality to things that are moving on the page. But the relevant to us developer side of that is easing curves. If you use motion that's just plain linear, there's no acceleration, there's no deceleration, you're defying the law of physics because there's no inertia, uh, that feels lifeless and robotic and dull. But easing curves can bring your animation to life. What do I mean by easing curves? I'm going to show you a CSS example. Here the dot is moving back and forth with a linear timing function. There's no acceleration, there's no deceleration, it feels just kind of stiff and wooden and dull. If we want to accelerate a little bit when the motion starts, whether it starts at the right or left end, uh, we would ease in. The CSS keyword we have, you'll find the same keywords present in GSAP and in jQuery if you're still using that to run animations. Uh, and we're animated, all these libraries are using the same handful of keywords for timing functions. 
If you wanted to decelerate a little bit on the way out, you would ease out. And if you wanted to do some of each, accelerate on the way in, decelerate on the way out, ease in out is a great thing to do. The browser default is ease. I didn't picture that here. But sometimes you're like, you know what? I need to write something even a little different than those options. What else can I do? You can write a cubic Bezier function with a handful of coordinates, coordinates in it, and each coordinate pair is the location of a handle there on the graph. It's kind of like dragging handles around in Illustrator, sketch one of those vector apps. And you draw your coordinates, it creates a line, and that's the line the motion follows for acceleration and deceleration. So to provide another example, our friend Linear is back on top again, as boring as ever. And now I've got a function on the bottom that's kind of cool. It's got a less than zero handle location on the first coordinate and a greater than one on the second. So what the dot is doing, if you can catch that, is it's kind of rocking back and then zooming into the motion. And then when it gets to the end, it forgets to stop on time and kind of overshoots and has to come back. This is not the right thing to do on every single piece of animated content on your site. Too much of that feels, again, exaggerated and weird and distracting. But if this matches your client's brand, you can actually work with easing curves to match brand values. Fun thing to dig into. I also want us to make animation smooth. Start making it alive, easing curves are great. Let's also make it smooth. And we already had a great introduction to Jenk. And in terms of visual animation, yeah, if it drops significantly below 60 frames per second, the users are going to see visual start, stop, choppiness, and that's going to be a distraction. It's not just uh, the JavaScript processing that can slow that down. The CSS properties we use in our animations can also slow the browser down to the degree that motion feels choppy and bad. So please don't do that. The best CSS properties to transition or to animate are opacity and transform. The browser has created a special layer that can be animated in a fantastically smooth way, and you, don't, you almost don't have to worry if you stick to those two properties. Color-related properties are kind of in the meh zone. Um, your mileage may vary. Test it out. DevTools has a really neat little box that will throw up in the corner of your site, and you can actually watch your frame rate go by as you interact with your site and kind of do a timing graph with DevTools. And then please uh, avoid these. These are not properties meant to be animated. Just don't. Uh, these are the best ways to almost instantly get the browser to slow down and to get choppy with visual motion. So avoid these. Uh, most of your good CSS uh, or animating libraries that run with the JS interface are working with opacity and transform as much as possible. Uh, because those are the, by far the most important thing, or uh, performant things. So yeah, make it smooth. And then also respect your users. And this is the one I want to say maybe loudest of all. There's a media query that lets users specify they don't want a lot of motion. You've heard me say a couple warnings for people if there's vestibular uh, concerns, uh, dizziness issues that comes from animation on a screen. Uh, the world has all sorts of parallax and real effects that in, uh, communicate 3D in depth to people. That way we don't walk off of cliffs or into trees or buildings. Um, but sometimes when those are represented on a screen in an artificial digital way, that can cause users a lot of pain and discomfort. So here's the nuclear option. If they've set that media query, and you can do this on your phone, on your computer, you can set reduce uh, motion or reduce animation, whatever your operating system has called it. Turn off all your animations, turn off all your transitions. We don't use important much, and you'll hear a lot of CSS devs say, don't ever use important. No, no, this is actually a good thing, because here important is respecting your user's preference above anything else. And that's the right kind of place to use important. Another option is if you've gotten into CSS custom properties, you can just set all your delays and durations for everything to zero. Uh, this may be more robust if you're running animations on things that are off screen to begin with, and you actually want to make sure the animation does complete. Um, this will make sure that all the animations are immediately at their completed state without any uh, delay or duration for a piece of motion to occur. So yes, above all, respect your users. Uh, some slides of resources. I like resources, and hopefully this is awesome. You all are very smart adults, so I'm not going to read you every slide, but I'm just going to click through them real fast. These are live links. You can come to the slides later. Click on the ones that interest you the most. And yeah, last thing is a little demo of how this might work in a sample Ember app. Because I am contractually obligated to make a to-do app, that's what I did. <laughs> the first thing you notice is we're calling attention to the slide that's overdue. September 15th has come and gone. 
and yet that slide is still visible. That little orange glow behind it though, I had actually worked out a really cool trick for animating the box shadow that didn't involve animating a box shadow. It put a shadow on a separate pseudo element and animated that. But even that was enough that in my testing, it was preventing the browser from doing other hover-based animations and transitions, so I cut it out. Because that's one of the rules with animations. You test things out, and if it's causing problems, you remove it. And the animation is not more important than your users being able to successfully get through the app. So I want to mark this completed because, as you all have seen, the slides are done. Uh, so yeah, you can see the box, or the checkbox animates the background color, but it doesn't just change the color. There's a little circle full of the darker hue that expands from the center. And that shows, as we said earlier, play with me. I'm an interactive thing. And then it slides over to the completed column, and uh, it's still in chronological order. I decided I don't really want to get my brakes checked right away. I want to spend, actually, most of October being worried about my brakes as well. <laughs> so yeah. And it automatically sorts based on that uh, to do, uh, the due date attribute. I can come up to the corner and add a new item. The form field, here's where I'm coming from, comes out of the big plus button. And so what's a good new to do item? Um, oh, I have a whole bunch of things I did here during sample data time. So let's make it by lunch. And I'll do that in a couple days. and it animates into the right spot. So at this point, it's good for a quick word about, oh, one more thing. If I wanted to delete an element, uh, confirm yells at me first, and then in deleting it, we animate it down to the trash can. So this is a mix of CSS and Ember animated. CSS is used for the checkbox circle hover. Um, it's also used for the appearance and disappearance of the new form that creates a new to-do. Since the positions are known, fixed position near the middle, fixed position off to the top uh, audience right. Uh, we don't need JavaScript to try and track location on that, so CSS with transform is all we needed. We're toggling a class uh, with an Ember property in there. Uh, but anything that has to do with sorting the list, putting new, loca uh, new items in the list in the right location, and throwing away list items to the trash can, Ember Animated is helping out with that. It's a really neat little library and it watches your model, and you can have it sort on your due date uh, for a particular item or any other sorting property you want to use for your, your array of objects in the model. And it handles some of the really good uh, computation-based JavaScript things, like where is the final state for this element going to be? Let's kind of pause everything and then move stuff so that everything shifts at the right time. Very handy, and you can also see, built with a view for performance. Uh, those are pretty much buttery smooth animations, and uh, that's a really good thing. So that is uh, a sample app showing several of the ways that these animation principles can be put into practice. And with all that said, I'm James Steinbach, and I've really enjoyed talking with you all today. Uh, I'm a developer at Dockyard, and uh, it's been good to be here. If you want to follow me and have more conversations, I'm J.D. Steinbach on most of the Internet places, and would love to uh, chat more with you there. Thank you. <laughs>